This is Podkit, episode 58, Code Harvest, on Saturday, June 6th, 2020, and now, when there's only one option. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk58. Big, uh, it's Podkit. It's Podkit. Big month here. It's uh, <laughs> It seems like a long time since we recorded last, but it's um, been since May 1st, and uh, time flies. Yeah, the uh, world seems a lot different than, than back then. It's true that in real time, this is probably one of the smaller intervals between episodes, but I think in like 2020 adjusted time, it might actually be the longest between episodes. I feel like it's been like multiple years in terms of 2020 adjusted societal experience of time. Yeah, for sure. You know, we, we've often operated the network and some shows on the network by, you know, um, tech cycle and the tech cycle has been severely disrupted, I would say. And, uh, world events are sort of more in the spotlight than usual. So it's just been a strange year and a strange time. Yeah, it's it's been been a couple of weeks lately, at least. Um, yeah, so we're you know we're based out of St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, so we've we've been experiencing the the beginnings and start of um, the protests after the killing of George Floyd. Um, lots of looting went through, but that really isn't anything to compare against the uh, police brutality and things against. Uh, the black people here um, and around the country and things. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see that it started an international movement um, and really hope some good reforms and, uh, you know, t- taking out police departments, it sounds like, in Minneapolis maybe, and starting up new community-driven um, departments and things. So I'm hoping it'll bring some good change. We really need it. And it's 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 almost depressingly like 1968 when there were um, race uh, equal rights riots going on, and then the midst of the space race um, last weekend, SpaceX launched the first uh, crewed launch on commercial crew and the first crewed mission uh, from the U.S. since 2011. So it's been like new space news, um, equal rights protests, and things. So it's been it's been a wild time. Hope hope everyone's been donating and supporting and and doing what they can to help the the effort. So Brian, you live in Uptown, um, so you were kind of closest probably to a lot of what was going on up there. Like, how was that? What was that like? Um, I mean, I I felt I felt fine. Um, I mean, I, it was difficult sleeping. There were helicopters and and things flying around, and you know police cars and some some of the nights and things um when the protest was out by the fifth precinct um i could see smoke from burning buildings and hear some flashbang grenades and fireworks um got a a smell of some of that burnt stuff at one point um i mean around me a lot of stuff was boarded up there was some looting a couple of nights um but what's what I've gotten out of it is the really the sense of community that has come out and rallied behind the movement. Um, there's a lot of street art on the plywood on boarded up businesses in a way that like St. Paul doesn't really have. And it seems like around the country, there isn't as much of, so I think that's kind of a uniquely Minneapolis thing. Um, so that's been really great to see um, lots of portraits of George Floyd and black lives matter and um, advocating for coming together. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, you know, in St. Paul, I I, I kind of walked down a little bit of university too, and you know, there there's some stuff that's burned out, um, and you know, a bunch of things are boarded up, and not all of the things that are boarded up are boarded up because they were attacked directly, but just because they, they were worried about being attacked there. Um, but you know, uh, over the last week or so, uh, things have gone from fair, fairly. Uh, fairly uh high high alert and a lot of civil unrest and a lot of like you know the national guard was here and and police forces were out 
Um, but in the last week or so, a lot of that's quieted down. Uh, and there were very nice um, protests at the governor's mansion and at the um, Capitol. And uh, it was just nice to see those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, over here in Northeast, it was pretty, um, pretty quiet almost the whole time. Um, people were definitely on high alert, um, especially earlier on in the week when there was like um, a bunch of stress about, um, um, you know, folks started noticing, myself included, like pickups with no front plates or no plates at all mm -hmm. or, you know, right wing to white supremacist like stickers on the back. And, um, you know, while the Northeast has been pretty quiet, I think um, I'm not alone in Northeast where we have a lot of people who are really – um, you know, concerned and, um, certainly at least fancy themselves folks who are, um, trying to keep informed and, uh, and, and, and want to, want to help however they can in neighborhoods that were affected like North and Powderhorn, uh, and, and Longfellow, right. Um, um, but you know, one thing that I have to kind of chuckle at, um, myself, is I saw I saw one one such truck um, parked on one of my bike routes that I usually did back when I had a bike commute, right? Um, and so I was like, oh man, you know, I it was missing a front plate. It had the bumper stickers, right? You know, Second Amendment and something that looked otherwise looked kind of sketchy. And so I I went back around and I, I I took a picture of the plates and got the VIN number and stuff. And then I was like, well. There's one way to know for sure whether this is going to be a problem, right? Or whether whether this is this is likely more likely to be um, you know, of concern. Somebody may be doing something nefarious, or maybe it's just somebody who's kind of a right wing, you know, piece of crap who lives in my neighborhood. And that's to look back at my bike commute footage. And sure enough, this person has lived on that street for at least the past couple of years. So um, you know, it's it's interesting how, especially especially for those of us who are kind of f further from the actual um, epicenter, where a lot of you know the confirmed you know white supremacist violence has occurred, right? Um, and even some of us who are further from the protests, right, are um, you know can get kind of caught up in some of that um, without you know, and and I don't know, that was just a a, a as much of a confirmation as any for me that, you know, there's still work to do here, right? We can't ascribe it all to, um, to, you know, neo-Nazis coming into town, though that was clearly present too. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. There's, there's been a lot of misinformation and unverified uh, things on Twitter that I've been, um, especially last week, I've been trying right. to, to, to just read, read it, but, uh, understand that it's unverified and there's a lot of rumors and just there's, there's fear and so neighborhood groups are coming together and things but like a neighborhood group uh, force that doesn't trust anyone and is extra violent is is very much like the police so it's kind of a hypocritical piece as well um, but I think it's you know people dealing with it in different ways and um, but I think you know a lot of the for the like alt right and that kind of stuff, the private groups online, which you could compare to next door for a local neighborhood <laughs> group and things like that's right. that's where the you get the feedback loops of of people who just create uh situ you know worse and worse situations and things and so yep hundred percent of that going on yeah but yeah and the the other thing too is like in the north in the north side right where they um just across the river from me. Uh, where folks were the target of um, anti-black uh, arson and and violence and things like that, and you know, not only that, but historically, um, you know, North is a much more heavily policed um, and um, you know higher incidence of um, police brutality, particularly um, against black people. Um, uh, like you know, this the North still needs a lot of support, even even though they were not you know no few if any formal protests happened in north over the past couple weeks right like it's, there's still there's definitely still something else happening or there was something else happening there so i've been kind of trying to focus on north a little bit because i think sometimes that gets caught up so yeah, they definitely yeah. need the support and i think a lot of people from north minneapolis came down and were protesting and stuff 100 percent, 100 percent. 
Well, I hope everyone's able to donate and support as they're able to. Um, I know I have my, I've been at least donating to a company or places that are um, 501c3s or tax exempt stuff so I could have my work match everything that I've donated. Um, so, yeah. Yep. yep. Well, there isn't really a good transition, is there? No, there, there's not. <laughs> um, uh, so a few weeks before uh, all of the recent events, there was um, something more podkit topical of nature going on. Um, I believe that was React Europe. Was that what that was? Wow. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. I haven't seen a com- conference in a long time. Some conference, yeah. Um. Let's go with React Europe, and if it wasn't, um, I Google it, and you'll find out. Uh, but something actually came out of that um, alleged event, although we can't really remember what it was. An unconfirmed alleged event. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, and one of those things, you know, it's um, you know, it, the conference was supposed to be, you know, sort of uh, React oriented, and. You never really can tell if a React-oriented uh, conference will actually feature any new stuff from the React team or from Facebook or, you know, anybody in, in sort of the, the, the well-knowns of the community, right? Um, but in this case, somebody from Facebook uh, and a team from Facebook that was a separate from the React team actually had something new to share sort of with the world. And they called it Recoil. Um, so Recoil is, uh, no, this is going to be shocking, a state management library. What? Uh, and, uh, it's not Redux. And I know that's, I, I know, I know that's scary, but it's okay. Not, not everything wants Redux or needs Redux. Um, and so some of the things that you can imagine being a problem with Redux is that it sort of, and, 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 and by its nature centralizes all of your, all of your state, right? So if you have a Redux store, you you have one store and you put everything into it. So, you know, imagine you were making sort of a a large scale, uh, you know, ad, admin dashboard kind of thing. Uh, you you could code all of your components and all of your screens and all of your pages to be independent uh, and have to re-request all of this data and you know hope you get lucky and not not have overlapping entities all over the place. Or you might have Redux sort of centralize all this state, download a bunch of stuff as it needs to, and then compose it all client side, uh, sort of at the Redux level, and go and display it. Um, and so like that works, but obviously you know one of the things that you don't get then is tree shaking, and you don't get um, is, that, is that what I'm looking for? Not tree shaking. Um, you don't get what is it called, Brian? Code splitting? Code splitting. Yeah, it's the other one. Um, so you don't get code splitting, which means, you know, uh, you, you don't, you have to download your entire Redux store shape and all of its things up front, which means, look, your bundle's gigantic again. Um, but there are other problems too that Redux doesn't necessarily solve. So if you have, uh, you know, everybody's thought about the infamous shopping cart scenario, right? where you have a button on the page that says add to cart and then up in the corner there's a little cart icon and its little bubble increases from 1 to 2. Um well, you know, that that's cool, but where does the state for that shopping cart number? Where does that live? Does it live on the page component? Is it some context somewhere or is it indeed in Redux? Um so so what Recoil does is it provides an alternative um code splittable mechanism to have independent subtrees communicate state among each other. Huh. Uh, so there's a, a really cool video where um, the uh, sort of the, the author of the system here, um, you know, explains what it is and how it works. And so um, the author here at Facebook is Dave McCabe. Uh, and he's not from the React team, as we formerly know it. He's just, it was a team of a few people kind of contributing this feature from elsewhere in the business. And um, it's it's really cool. It's really interesting. Um, I haven't actually used it yet outside of a um, code sandbox that I just threw together on the first day that everybody saw it. But it um, 
it's API compatible with, um, you know, use state uh, hooks. So if you have a use state for your um, cart uh, count, cart item count, you can use, instead of use state, use recoil state. And now that state can be shared across multiple components and they will both be re-rendered but the trees above them don't necessarily have to get re-rendered. So you're sort of optimizing in two directions and you don't need to have that state shared um, down both trees in a common ancestor parent component. Uh, so it's just really interesting. It's, um, it, it's always interesting to see the problems that somebody uncovers at Facebook and then their crazy approach to go and solving it. Uh, and, and it's also funny how common this use case really is in real life. So pretty cool. I think we'll be able to talk more about it, um, sometime in the future once somebody actually uses it. Um, yeah, I don't know, like Brian, are you stuck in the Redux life? Um, I use Redux, but not, I mean, I haven't really added to a reducer in, months and months and months mm-hmm. it, like we have some global stuff that's in redux and that's it that's it all the features in my app at work we it's mostly um we do data fetching through um component state mm-hmm. now we, we, we consume some like global filters and things from redux that are a part of it but it's mostly just reading um yep. so yeah our global stuff is in redux but we don't have to edit that very much anymore uh, how about how um, about you brandon um I have one project that uses Redux through Redux Starter Kit or whatever it's called. Yep. Um, everything else is smaller um, or everything else has a lesser use of Redux or is like old fashioned Redux. So there's, you know, pre Starter Kit. But I think overall, you know, in terms of new stuff, mostly I'm not using Redux at all. Um, so on a project I just completed that you guys both know about, there um where we're doing a lot of stuff with like uploading files um you know locking down objects so that they're um only editable by one user um at a given time stuff like that um that's all kind of uh that that is all kind of managed um using context and yep. component local state and stuff like that um and context has actually been a pretty solid tool for it but i think i could you know could perhaps benefit from recoil um because right now all those context providers are on on the root right and and so if you um watch the video he'll uh dave actually goes and makes an example where uh if you have five pieces of state that you need to share sort of at distant subtrees well the only way to do that is with context in you know baseline react and then you'll have to have five context providers hanging out yeah. providing that. But um, what that'll do is it'll cause re-renders randomly all the way down that tree, and that's not necessarily useful. So yep. yeah, if you if you're using context now for um, you know sort of this ad hoc concept of you know sharing data down deeply in the tree, uh, the recoil workflow could be very beneficial. Absolutely. Yeah, and like kind of another thing with that too is there's a little bit of a difficulty that I I don't know that recoil will address this, but a thing that's been really annoying too is like, um, not only necessarily causing re-renders, but also I, I guess tied it intrinsically to re-renders, I guess in some mm-hmm. ways, but it would recompute some of the some of the functions mm-hmm. that I want to use that that causes them to be less useful to me, <laughs> right? Um, so like for example when you set a lock right um i don't want to um have that lock setter function i want that to be stable as much as possible right um because i want it to be run on an interval for example so like you know not necessarily on an interval but like on um on a input event Mm -hmm. call it and have that input event be throttled. Well, if it's constantly removing and adding the input event, then that throttle is being lost. And, you know, how yeah. do you handle that in a reasonable fashion? So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's stuff like stuff like that where I recognize that this is probably not the best solution. So it's always cool to see when when folks come up with something new. But 
be and you know this seems like one of the first like post redux paradigms for sure in that way right because like context w- w- was a thing that caused everybody to flip out and be like oh no no more redux which is not true but like this seems like a higher level tool that provides a new way of thinking about what redux currently thought about so who knows it'll be interesting yeah so i you know in, in a lot of ways this is sort of orthogonal to redux um yeah. still like redux is there to manage huge amounts of uh universal application state like if you are making photoshop you're not going to use this you're not going to use recoil like there just is not enough like there's not enough structure but if you if you need if you need all of that structure and you need one thing to cascade uh, to dozens of components all over the place randomly, then that's where Redux really is for. Um, so I'll say one more thing about this. It, it, it sort of reminds me about uh, view subscribers. So in Vue, back in the good old days of Vue.js, remember that, everybody? Oh, Throwback. Man. That it's is. Thing. They have hooks now. I, I don't know what they have, but uh, it doesn't look good. Um, you know, get it? Because it's a view. It doesn't look good. Okay. Right. Uh, you guys had no reaction. Hot. Okay. I see that. So many, so many layers. So many layers. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it, it reminds me a lot of the view subscriber system where um, you can have um, components change their state and they'll do whatever they need to do. Uh, but then you can have a watcher just hang out somewhere else and it can watch another component's sort of state, if it can see it at least, uh, in the tree and it can go and react to it. Uh, so there, there are certain ways that this has already been kind of done. Um, and I know that MobX has been in the React community for quite some time. And I've tinkered with it a couple of times, but I, I never really used it because I didn't think it had enough market share for actual practical enterprise usage. Mm-hmm. So I guess we'll just see where the Steam, like if this gain, gains traction and if this picks up Steam and stuff. There's some interesting features around like asynchronous stuff too. I'm looking through the docs. Yep. Um, they use React Suspense, um, letting you synchronize state to server calls or vice versa. There's like synchronous, asynchronous. There's um, bi-directional state syncing. Um, it's uh, quite interesting. And now it's, a lot of that I think is you know unstable or under development still. But yeah. So uh, I guess as a warning to everybody that this thing is hanging out on version. 0.0.8 right now and that that was tagged five days ago so this might not be like something you want to use in production today but something you might want to look forward to sometime yeah, yeah the, the api reference still has a few methods or functions that are uh there are pages but there's there's just a title and there's nothing on it so it's just stubbed out still, so it's it's good that that method can do whatever you want it to do. Exactly, yeah, it's something to just look out for. Um, and I think um, I've seen some React people say, you know, this is from a team on Facebook. It is not like it's the new recommended way from the React core team. Yep. Um, it's it's just another thing out there. We'll see what happens. Um, Redux is not dead. Redux doesn't ever have to be dead. There's and in a fact, good use case for it. In some I places. think Redux is more alive than ever with the new Redux toolkit. Yeah, so yeah. Brandon, you've mentioned you use it because I've never used it. I never went through my app and replaced it. Um, I don't feel like our Redux implementation is... I mean, yeah, there's some like duplicate stuff with all the switch statements and that kind of thing, but like, it's not too bad. It's not the largest store. There are maybe like eight reducers in there and so i don't know the the idea to me of pulling in redux toolkit for another library it just are the the bundle size increases worth it now i guess in some ways there's a lot less app code because those functions abstract it all out yeah but i would say no like if you were truly worried about bundle size i would say no right yeah i'm not really that worried i'm just just kind of more curious but yeah, I guess I would say most of the positive from it has been in like initializing the store, right? Like it's 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 a little bit easier to set up, I think. But now that it's already been set up, I don't think I, I don't feel that it's necessarily all that much different from 
when I last use Redux without Redux Toolkit. Okay. So what, what do you think about having direct integration with like Immer and stuff? Like uh, initially I thought that was going to be obnoxious and I would hate it and I would never use Immer ever because it wasn't re, uh, you know built into Redux. But now yeah. that it's built into Redux Toolkit, I don't have to feel bad using it. Uh, so what yeah, do you, I what mean, do you think we about don't. That? We don't use it. So at least to my knowledge, if, if we use it, it's transparent to me. So, um, that means it's so good. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I mean, we're not, yeah. So my, my mental model of Immer, right. That's that immutability thing where like it allows you to mutate it, but under the hood, it handles all of the immutability for you. Correct. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, I think basically we're still taking the approach that we are responsible for making sure it's immutable. So we're doing unnecessary work. Possibly. Now, like for me, I've found when a reducer, it doesn't have any actions handled. It just returns the same state. So you, you're you not like cl- deep cloning everything on every action, which I don't think has been the purpose. But like when some state changes, it's good. It, I mean, yeah, I found that managing immutability inside of a Redux reduce, or store isn't the worst thing. You have to learn it. But um, in at least my use cases, it's not too bad it's more like cloning date objects um Mm -hmm. is something i try to do and then like yeah nested objects i try to do a little bit of but yeah exactly so i I mean like my components yeah my components don't mutate anything it's mostly just reading and then calling functions that dispatch actions and so it's it's even if it wasn't immutable and a new reference every time it still wouldn't beat the end of the world i don't know Mm -hmm. The Immer stuff really does make a lot of that um, deeply nested object boilerplate that you have to do. And you have to think about it so carefully and just meticulously because otherwise you'll either blow away your entire store or you'll have corrupted objects or worse, undefined yeah, Maybe everywhere. both. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the Immer really just takes that all and puts it all away. Yeah. It's also funny that, you know, uh, I'm sure you've both heard of Re- Redux Ducks. No. No, I don't think I have. It's some kind of pattern that somebody likes somewhere. I don't know. Uh, but it's you You put all of your reducers, you put all your actions, you put all of your uh, types, you put, on, you put it all into one file and you port that file. I hate doing that. Don't like it uh, because those are different things. But it turns out if you use Redux Toolkit, it does it all for you. So now that doesn't matter. I mean, my pain point with Redux is very much still like um, async effects, right? Like um, I'm I'm using um, Redux Observable on some things, and I can't stand it. I don't I don't enjoy the uh, like RxJS patterns. Oh no, um, and that seems very heavy for dependencies. Same with Redux Observable. Like they're both very cool ideas on how to manage asynchronous stuff and streaming streams of data, but you have to go all in on Redux to make it worth it, in my opinion. It's um, very hard. Now, right. I've never used Redux Thunk, but I think that's a little lighter weight, right? Oh, yeah. Thunk is Definitely. very, very simple. So I think, like, if for the apps I work on, that would make more sense to use. Yep. Um, now, I've, I have seen some sagas implemented that I would say are, is a pretty poor practice of, um, you know, a saga will dispatch multiple actions within handling of one action, and um, read from the the Redux store mid saga and that kind of stuff, and I think that's a a uh, dangerous mix of of state. You know, I think a, a reducer and an action should be as pure as possible. You have the inputs of the action, and like maybe a, a mid- some middleware th- thunk or uh, epic or saga, you know, calls out to some API and comes back and dispatches a new action, but that should be pure and it shouldn't be reading from other stuff. And if it, if it needs data from the store, it should be coming in through the action on a payload property or something. That's the thing that's sometimes so interesting. So like that's, that's how sagas like have almost always worked is basically a saga would dispatch a bunch of actions and might dispatch others might run other sagas and stuff like that, but it makes it impossible to follow. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so hard to like go through and refactor something because everything depends on the saga doing everything and then all of a sudden it's 
impossible to refactor because you have to rewrite half your application to decouple all of those things. Now, mm -hmm. at the same time, if you're all in on this saga handles everything related to state management, if this one button is clicked or like this one action is dispatched. Um, so if that's the case, then you can just re-implement it in the same kind of approach and then it should work everywhere probably. But I don't know. Yeah. It's two different ways to think about it. There's the, you know, pure approach and then they just let it do everything for me approach. Yeah. And like one of the other issues with sagas too, is that like, usually when you when you took that approach like hit this button which dispatches an action that kicks off the saga that might kick off two or three other sagas and then complete um there's kind of a critical issue with sagas and error handling where errors would just get um silenced basically so you'd have to go back and look at you'd have to traipse through the code and figure out which actions actually did get dispatched um and do your best to try and figure out like oh man like where where is this error actually occurring what where is this issue um, because there's no traces for it. So there's a lot of like console logging, stepping through generator functions and trying to figure out when it would stop executing. Uh, I'm told that's better now. It's the worst debug in compiled code because every, running everything through a regenerator runtime and stuff is just like, Awful. it's, yep. it's so hard. To, it's, you really can't debug it unless you have source maps. It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, and that, a lot of that is, um, if you're doing a bunch of, if you're dispatching a bunch of actions that make API calls and, and sync all this data up, managing loading handling with that is really difficult. Oh, yeah, it's impossible. Um, the examples I've seen just don't do it. And so you load an app, it just waits, it's just a blank screen, and then every and then suddenly stuff starts loading in, but it's um it's just yeah, it's really difficult. I think it's making more work than it needs to. Um something right. like React Query. You know, syncing uh, server state or something, I think, is a lot better approach for that kind of complicated stuff. Um, now, doing, you know, middleware and that kind of thing, I don't know. I haven't really looked into that with React Query too much, but. Yeah, um, I've used SWR on some projects recently, and I have some takes on that, but that's a story for another time. Yeah. After I, after I answer all my questions and allay all my frustrations with it, but. Yeah. Uh, there you go. State management. It's everybody's favorite thing. Well, that's the thing that's so funny too, is like I talked to people who work with Ember or Angular, right? Angular to a lesser degree, but definitely Ember folks are like, what are you talking about state management? This is a thing that React people cooked up because they're because Crazy. nobody wanted to make a decision, right? Nobody wanted to and and so everyone just like globbed onto Redux because they decided that was the de facto thing that the that the Facebook people encouraged but nobody really thought critically about it and here we are uh this is this is this is a paraphrased quote over the course of like five people who i've had this conversation with but i tend to take that attitude too even as a react person it's just like come on <laughs> nobody's ever everyone kind of kind of hand waved it under the under the under the banner of like you know oh well you get to make the decision as the react developer and it's like well yeah the decision but you know there's only one option. Yeah, when you, when you're making a decision out of a set of one, that's not really a decision. Well, there's recoil now, and there's mobx, and yeah, just using context and deal with re-renders. You know, it's fine. Now you have right. decision paralysis. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, do we want to cut it here and move to new Twitter followers? I think that's a good plan. Yeah, let's do it. I'll start. I have probably followed some people, but. The but more importantly, I've unfollowed like four thousand people. Wow! So there you go. I'm down to let's see. I should have grabbed the number right now. I was at five thousand and twenty people I was following, uh, by at 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 its peak, and now I'm down to one thousand one hundred and sixteen. Oh, you so, got to get to three digits. Come on, Brandon. You're so close. I know. I know. Well, the problem is I, I look at the people I follow now and I have to make like actual decisions to unfollow people I know, which is that I don't want to do that. Do you know a that. thousand people who are on Twitter? I wow. know them within <laughs> within two to three degrees. That's, two to three degrees. I don't so, know if that counts. Well, you know, it's three like... Three degrees is... I wouldn't count that as knowing them. Well... You know of them. It's like It's like... Dan Abramov is probably within three degrees, maybe. I don't know. Sure. Right? 
for the record, I did on follow Dan, but um, aside from that, like you know, there's there's just folks that like, um, you know, over the past 10, 11 years, I've been on Twitter, right? That you interact with enough that it's like, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to unfollow them. The person you followed for eight years, like you, you feel a lot closer to them and following them. Yeah, I get yeah. that. Yeah, and then there's people I know IRL that I don't want to unfollow, even if they're not necessarily adding a ton to my timeline. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. The histrionics of that are kind of, I don't know. Who knows? How about you, Brian? So now that I've unfollowed 4,000 people. I've followed like 10 people maybe since last episode, which is quite a bit. Um, For the like tech ones, we'll start here. I followed uh, Jane Wong, who does like reverse engineering of products as they're being developed. Um. So she, in, in a normal political time, um, would talk about like upcoming features in Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatnot. So that's just kind of cool. Um, it's another web dev reverse engineer. Um, I follow Firefox Dev Tools because they're great. I love Firefox, um, so I followed their account. I don't remember what they tweeted. I think the release notes about um, new Firefox features. I don't know. And then I followed um, Cam Ranicus. Uh, he is a uh, he works at Target. He did a, a talk on um, the Excalibur JS um, game f- uh, engine at React Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago. So I gave him a follow. Um, he does uh, front end stuff at Target. And then finally, I followed Tony Webster, who Tony is Tony Webster. Uh, tweeting a ton of really great stuff around um, the protests and Black Lives Matter movement um, around the Twin Cities here. He's a, like a journalist, uh, I don't know, his bio is journalist, photographer, public records, nerd, web engineer. So kind of a, a mix of, it sounds like you, Brandon, um, but a little more focus on journalism than tech, at least from what you focus on. I don't know. I got to say, Tony, um, I have... Never met Tony in person, but uh, at one point we attended security B-sides together, um, which is to say that Tony was also in the room. And I remember being like, I know Tony Webster's here, but Tony is known for being kind of incognito, so there's no way I will ever uh, know which of these people is Tony Webster. But we were chatting about it on, on the conference on Twitter. This is probably like seven or eight years ago now. Um, but Tony is a super awesome, super kind person to the point where like I've asked him for advice um, about starting a software business, about um, you know what what it's like to to be an independent contractor. Um, and, um, you know, every time he's been extremely gracious, especially for somebody as busy, um, and as high volume, uh, as, as, as Tony, as Tony is, um, you know, like the other anecdote I can give is like, I had a coworker, um, a while back who had a question about the Minnesota data practices act in connection with some stuff that they were dealing with. And I was like, I should definitely, you know, there's one person I can think of that asked this question to and it was Tony. And, um, uh, and I was like, you know, I'm bad at email. So I just assume everybody's bad at email. Uh, but he was like, yeah, yeah, have, have this person email me. And so apparently, you know, he got an answer to this person in like 10 seconds flat. Uh, it was really funny. Um, because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at email, but he was, he was right there, especially with, you know, he's probably an order of magnitude busier than, than I. Um, so I don't know all that's just to say, Tony's a really, really stand up, like great person. Um, and you know, we're fortunate that he's here and documenting things and holding folks in government accountable. So shout out to Tony for being a badass. What about you, Ryan? That was a great recap, Brendan, by the way. Um, yeah, I don't, I didn't, I didn't follow uh, as many people as you, Brian, and I didn't unfollow as many people as you, Brandon. (laughs) Um, so somebody linked to um, Jimmy Bogard's Twitter uh, in one of my work chats um, uh, who's doing some .NET work, and I think they were using either Automapper or the other thing uh, that Jimmy made here. And I don't know, I was just reading some of his blog posts, um, really, really, uh, you know, sort of insightful blog posts, actually, um, you know, about, um, you know, testing and about, um, you know, how to do uh, – tests through your database and 
how you should think about DTOs and how you should think about uh, you know different naming conventions for messages uh, if you're doing like um, queues and stuff. Really, just really good advice and topics and just cool Twitter account. Uh, so following him is pretty fun. And then on the other on the other account here, uh, I have Samantha T. Porter, who is um, a PhD at the U, and um, also she is a local neighbor. Uh, and we sort of met on Twitter, um, sort of following the same events that were happening in real life. So that was pretty cool. Sam is super awesome. Uh, I presented a lot, uh, after Sam and other friend to the universe, Colin McFadden, who uh, was at the U, um, uh, worked at the U and I worked at the U and he still works at the U. Um, but Colin was always noted as like a, a hardcore like um, student employee um, who, um, you know, became extremely amazing and, and is now like, and has been for quite some time, a pillar of, um, like good skunk works it at the U. Um, and they presented after, after, uh, before, um, uh, before me at mini webcon a couple of years ago, uh, which is where I met Sam, who's an extremely, um, extremely, extremely awesome person who's doing lots of stuff like that. So I guess this is just turning into Brandon endorses like Ryan and Brian's Twitter followers. <laughs> I see how you followed 5,000 people. Yeah. Right. Um, but no, um, uh, Sam is super great. And, um, Sam has been working on some amazing, amazing, like preservation stuff, um, for, for, for the U in terms of like, um, you know, photogrammetry and things like that. So that's what she presented on. Um, and, just yeah thoroughly endorse um sam porter too so i don't know there you go yeah that's all i followed i only followed two whole people (laughs) well i endorse both 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 of the follows that i endorsed excellent there you go yeah what do you guys have coming up next time in the next month or so well, according to my um 2020 calendar there's about to be either a meteor or um a giant hurricane or something coming up here in in uh, July. So I guess we'll see. Um, but before then, there might be WWDC later. Oh my god, that's next week, isn't it? Yeah, well, maybe in a week and a half because it's on the 22nd, I believe. Oh, sure. Um, but that'll be pretty fun. Uh, you know, maybe we'll see some cool stuff. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Like... It'd be nice if iOS was actually good and useful uh, instead of just secure. Um, I mean, it'd, it'd be nice to actually have some features. I don't know. Um, so I guess we'll find out about that. Um, maybe we'll see some of the future of macOS because nobody likes whatever version of macOS is out right now. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to that. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I have a lot of work to do because uh, it's time you know it's um it's a time of the year where work happens yeah yeah harvest code <laughs> yeah. harvest code harvest <laughs> <laughs> i'm probably pretty much in the same boat lots of work might tune into whatever conferences or things people do i don't know we'll see but um you know, I've been saying for months now, you know, it's it's always felt like we've been on the precipice of like work slowing down, but it's never happened. Right. Exactly. So, it's the opposite. Yeah. So I guess, um, you know, I, I'm I'm I've finally learned my lesson and somebody inquired about a new project recently. And I was like, I don't know. Let's see. Let's wait until I actually have time for it, which is not now. Um, so that's a weird new thing. Um other than that, just going to try to enjoy the sunny weather while we get it um, before the meteor hits. So. Yep. How about you, Brian? Um, trying to stay cool. It's kind of hot out now. It's summer. Uh, I'm moving in a couple weeks to, you know, like down the block, same same management. Um, I've been biking more. I'm actually, Ian's on his way to my apartment right now. And, you know, so I probably have to scramble as soon as we stop recording. So we should um, all say, hi, Ian. Hi, Ian. Hi, Ian. Because he'll listen to this in like a week and he'll think it's pretty amusing that he was on his way right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, the MS-150 would have been next weekend, so I'm going to try to do some sort of a long ride. I'm not sure what that's going to look like because I haven't uh, tracked down anyone to ride with yet. But, you know, maybe just me, maybe someone else. I don't know. 50 miles? We'll see. I don't know. Um, so that that's going on. Otherwise, yeah, just working. 
Uh, yeah, that's that's it. Where can we find you all? Brandon, you want to start? Yeah, you can find me uh, some places, but mostly on Twitter, where I'm Brandon underscore MN. I'm pretty much logged out of most slacks now, and um, I, I don't really post on Instagram anymore. So there you go, which for me is not saying very much because I used to post on Instagram quite a lot, but now I don't post on Instagram very much at all. So mostly on Twitter, that's where you can find me. Otherwise, I'll be in Northeast, same as it ever was. How about you, Ryan? It was ambiguous. I'll do it. Uh, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course, on my website, RyanRampersad.com, where I have not updated anything for June yet, because June has just started, and that means there's about 300 more days in June until I have to update that website. That's true. Mm-hmm. And you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me, where uh, shortly I will be posting a blog post about some CSS stuff that I've learned in the more recent times um, that has really helped. So um, I was working on that a couple of weeks ago, and then I didn't feel like working on it at all and don't think it was right to publish anything. So that'll be coming up here in the next week or so, probably. Nice. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk58. Uh, if you want to chat about the episode, you can find us on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. Or as always, tweet at us at thenexustv on Twitter. Um, and if you like what we're doing here at the network, you can give us a follow and tip or whatever you do at Patreon, which is patreon.com slash thenexustv. Don't worry, Brian. I'm just as confused as you are. I've gone to that Patreon like once or twice ever. It's Ian's thing. He yeah, manages it. it it's know. fine. It's fine. Hi, Ian. Um, Hi, Ian. Well, it's been great um, talking with everybody here for the past um, about um, 300 hours. Um, right, time, in time adjusted is, 2020 time. Yeah, time is weird. So it's, it's how, much, how long it's been. Um, enjoy your bike ride. Um, enjoy, enjoy not working for a few hours, Brandon. And um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right back at you. Perfect. Okay, we'll see you next time. See you next time. See you next time. Have a good one. Have a good one. I get have a good one. We gotta just keep doing these outros. Like we all say the same thing. We all say the same thing. We all say the same thing. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. Hooligans. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I noticed that when editing, every single time, have a good one, have a good one, have a good one. It's always a little different order. <sighs> Fine. No, okay. that's that's uh, that's top that was, level trolling. That was good. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.